All right, Jay, welcome to the show. Uh, for the sake of our listeners who don't know who you are, why don't you take a minute or two to kind of give us a bio on who you are? Yeah, so uh, husband, father of three wild ones. Uh, we we enjoy a nomadic lifestyle. Uh, right now we're in Florida where we spend about half the year. Uh, the rest of the time for the last couple of years, we've been traveling. And we, we've been able to do that because I got the boot out of the W-2. I got laid off during COVID. And luckily, prior to that, about uh, six or seven years prior to that, we started investing in, in buy and hold real estate. And we had built up enough to uh, to have a comf- comfortable uh, push out of the airplane without the, without the parachute, right? So uh, that's kind of us in a nutshell. And along the lines, I, I started the W two Capitalist Community um, because I'm an introverted person, even though I'm extremely comfortable behind a keyboard and a, and a, and a camera. Um, I didn't like being around other people, and I knew. We knew this real estate investing hit when we closed our first deal. We're like, all right, how do we do more? We close a couple more properties, and then we, then we realized, and that's my wife and I is the we, right? Uh, we realized that if we wanted to grow, we had to get around other investors. And uh, I was working remotely at the time. It was I was Zooming before people knew what Zoom was, and uh, or for the vast majority of us knew what Zoom was. And it just made sense for me to start this virtual mastermind. So it... Um, it's been incredible. I found a lot of great partners out there, a lot of great deals, and it's just it's just grown over time, right? It's been awesome. a real, real fun, exciting thing. <clears throat> what is how big is the community? What what kind of numbers are we talking? So we've got we've got a couple of different tiers of programs. Um, the high ticket item, uh, the ma- what we call the mastermind, we've got about sixty folks in there, mm-hmm. and then the pro community. We're about to relaunch in January. Um, some of those people who are in there for free are about to get booted out unless they want to sign up because we're about to revamp that entire thing uh, in in January. Um, but we've got a couple hundred in there right now. Gotcha, uh, just gotcha. In the pro community. So good, good. Well. Um... There's a lot about your story that resonates with me. I got three little, three, well, I guess one is technically still little. I got <laughs> a 17, a 14, and an eight-year-old, all girls. Gotcha. So, And then uh, I also had a W-2 income for a long time and, and was able to, to walk away from that now living on, you know, real estate and business income, yeah. which is um, very fortunate to be able to do that, as I think you would agree. But um Let's get into. I, I think you kind of piqued our interest when you when you reached out to the podcast on the three biggest mistakes that self managing landlords make. And this is a this is kind of close to home with us, as I, we were talking about before. Like we own yeah. a property management company, so you know we obviously professionally manage properties. But our listeners, the accidental landlords, this is one of the biggest decisions they have to make because yeah. they are. I don't want to say given, but in some cases given, like they inherit or, or you know, they, they fought hard to buy their first home and now they're in a position where they have to go somewhere else. So yeah. now they're going to be a landlord. The first decision yeah. you have to make is, am I going to manage it myself? Or That's... Am I going to hire a property management <laughs> company? So let's yeah. let's dive right into that. And I think that'll lead us in a couple different directions as we go. But yeah, I'll, I'll turn this back over to you for, for starting that conversation. Yeah. So the number one mistake I think that most people run into when they become an accidental landlord and they get into property management thinking about, do I want to hire somebody or do I not want to hire somebody? The number one thing I think is the unknown, like fear of the unknown. What is it going to look like to manage this property? You know, you listen to all the, the, the podcast talking about, uh, toilet leaks, you know, calls at 2 AM. You don't have to deal with that as a landlord. Mm-hmm. And I will say I've been a landlord effectively now for almost 10 years. Uh, I received my first 2 a.m. phone call it, about a leaky toilet. And luckily we have systems in place that uh, I didn't know about it until um, uh, until about seven o'clock the next morning when I woke up and looked at my phone and I saw, oh, there was an issue. It got resolved before I even knew anything about it. And so the biggest thing is the fear of unknown. You tell, you, you know, you tell yourself this story of, I'm going to get inundated with those calls. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to have the systems in place. And most people just default to, uh, it pushes them toward a property management company that they essentially don't vet correctly or know how to follow up. And I think we're going to get into that a little bit, especially knowing your background of, of property management <laughs> services. But the biggest thing is, is the fear of the unknown, right? It pushes them to make uh, a bad decision, in my opinion. So gotcha. And then in the, just for more context to the conversation do you currently self-manage or have you in the past or what does that look like for you 
I, I started managing, um, I managed until we got about three units, uh, then had a full-time job and I was like, you know what? I don't want to do, I wasn't very good at it. I, I, and this kind of gets into point number two is I didn't treat it as a business. Uh, I got real close with my tenants. And so mm -hmm. anytime you develop a personal relationship with, with your tenants, um, you know, they, they, especially the professional tenants, they know how to pull on the heartstrings. Right. And I was not very good at it. And then this, uh, we went five or six years, uh, with, with outsourcing everything to professional property managers. And then in the last year and a half, we took everything back in house, uh, for some reasons I think we're going to get into. And this time around, I just, you know, straight up, Hey, it's a business. It's not just our money at this point in time. It's other, you know, it's our partner's money and it's, Hey, you know, we, we developed or adopted a lot better systems to make sure things were, make sure things, to make sure our residents were paying on time, uh, paying a, and make sure they're paying on time was B. Um, and then, so it's, it's a lot, you know, you learn a lot in the last year and a half. I've made, a, learned a lot when it comes to self-managing and the biggest, one of the biggest things kind of point number two is treat it like a business. That is what it is. I, I saw this post the other day where a guy was asking about, uh, we're coming up here on the holidays, right? And he's, I've got this tenant. He's paid, you know, he's paid on time every time for the last 11 months. I want to give him a gift card or something like that for, for whatnot. And I'm sitting there thinking, man, I don't like, I like the idea of, you know, incentive behavior is repeated behavior, right? But I just don't know about giving a gift card. I don't know. I just, I couldn't get past it. I was like, that opens to me, that opens up a more personal touch that I don't want to have with my tenants, you know, because they, I got, yeah, my I experience gotta, goes back to, Hey, they're going to pull in the heartstrings uh, afterwards, you know? Yeah. So I, let's talk about that. So, <laughs> cause I haven't, I agree with you. Like, well, I'll just say, don't let me forget about the gift card thing. Cause I want to come okay. back to that. But, um, one, I agree with you, like your, your number one thing is if you don't know what you're getting into, you've got to kind of figure that out. Like don't go into it just blind, which a lot of people do because it's like the default. Like if you don't want to invest the time and effort to vet and hire a management company, you're kind of stuck with doing it on your own and you just yeah. kind of stumble through it and there's mistakes that get made. And then the, the second point of treat it like a business. So on our podcast, we had, we've had, you know, professional real estate investors, we've had, um, attorneys, CPAs, insurance professionals, all of these people that surround rental properties and investing. Right. And their number one thing they say is, you have to treat it like a business. And if you yeah. don't, you're going to get hurt, which is exactly what you're saying, which is which resonates exactly with what we are advocating for. You know, if you don't treat it like a business and you get personally involved with your tenants, nothing good comes from that. Nothing but good. <laughs> back to the gift cards, though, because this is I don't want to say a hotly debated thing, but obviously we own a management company and I do, we have what we call a, like a tenant retention program. Okay. And I, we, first off, we add, we do give gift cards at, at okay. the holidays, <laughs> but we do it in a manner that I think would alleviate the concern that you potentially have. So if you're self man, okay. if you're self managing your property, I would maybe hesitate more on the gift card just straight here you go. I'm not saying that yeah. I wouldn't do it. I think I would, you'd have to put some parameters in place. But if you think about a landlord tenant relationship, the majority of it is negative, right? Like it is. you don't call yeah. your tenant to say, "Hey, I'm you know, I just want to let you know we're going to cut the rent by $200 this year." You, you know, congratulations. No, it's the opposite. Like Hey, we're raising the rent. Hey, you didn't pay the rent on time. There's a late fee. Hey, you know, you got somebody living with you that's not on the lease. This is a problem. Like the majority of the interactions aren't positive. So we use the holidays just because it, you know, is it's, it's the it's the most uh, the giving obvious, it's the giving time yeah, of the, the year. Giving yeah. time of the year. Yeah. To have a positive interaction with our tenants, and ours is we give them a gift card to a local restaurant. We write them a nice card, and we say, Hey, we appreciate you. This gift is from the owner of the property and the management company. And we just want to say thank you. Take your family out for dinner. We appreciate what, you know, what you've done over the year. Yeah. That the feedback we get from that, and this is hard to quantify because it's, yeah, sure. it's difficult, 
but the feedback we get is amazing like no one's ever done this for us this is awesome you guys are great you know we love living in in the property that you guys manage and that in my opinion has a lot of value because when the tenant's happy they're going to stay longer they're going to pay the rent they're going to take care of the property now we do have problem tenants occasionally and and, and if we're in a particular dispute with a tenant we t we won't do the they gift card because they don't get a card because <laughs> we're you know fighting about something else yeah. but well, i think there's a ton of value where, in it here's where i'll challenge you on that and and so i ended my career in the uh sales and marketing area more, more on the sales side and mm -hmm. account management account executive side and so we we were put through you know bukus of training and 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 how to make a customer happy and it didn't matter who we brought in, they would come in and they say, okay, for every negative reaction a customer has with your company, you have to have 12 positive actions to offset that one negative mm -hmm. action, mm -hmm. you know? And I, and, and when I look at the numbers of how many interactions we can have with a, with a resident, there's no um, way we're getting to 12 positive. We're not getting to 12. We're yeah. not, even if it was seven, we're, there's no way that's going to happen. So I, you know, I have that sitting in the back of my mind. I'm like, even if we were to do that, is, is it going to be good uh, for certain tenants? Yeah, maybe, but we'll, we'll never get ahead of that. You know, and, th and that goes back to the analytical side of my brain where I treat it more like a business this time around. It, it's more of on my side. I know if I do that, then, then I'm going to open up you know, the heart for the bit of pulling the strings a little bit. And I'm just going to expose myself. And that's, that's a weakness that I have, right, mm -hmm. personally. Like mm -hmm. I, uh, cause one of my tenants that could call me right now and, and ask something, I'll be like, yeah, okay, we'll do it. Like a lady called yesterday. She said, Hey, our smoke detectors are beeping and we can't reach them. Uh, can you send somebody out here to, to change them out? I was like, well, yeah, our maintenance guy was supposed to do that in April when he did the, you know, when he did the, mm -hmm. uh, uh, when he changed the air filters out for the, I was like, yeah, he'll, he'll come over there. But then she started getting into, well, also there's this other thing and then also there's this other thing i was like all right yeah just put a ticket in we'll 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 get it we'll get it uh, fixed for you and it was clearly something their fault that we probably should charge them for but we're not going to charge them for it because they're they're a good tenant you know and we we hung up and and um she seemed very appreciative uh of what we we're doing for her and which also included some lease renewal conversations um they're looking to buy a house. They didn't want to sign a year lease. So we, we kind of navigated that with them. So they're very, yeah. more than thankful. But I, um, I'll, I'll say this too. It's, <clears throat> you can't draw a straight line to this gift card equaled a 50% yeah. ROI. It's impossible, right? Like, so yeah, it won't happen. <laughs> it, for us is it's more of a strategy with how we treat tenants. And in, traditionally speaking, there's this landlord versus tenant, kind of a little bit adversarial stereotype that's out there. Yeah. And I think that is entire. I think it's counterproductive and not in the best interest of the investor, the owner, the accidental landlord, whoever owns the asset. I think it's counterproductive. So, in to your point about, are we going to hit them twelve positive touches? Like that's probably not going to happen. Like yeah. even if we wanted to, it would be weird. We're going to send up something every <laughs> month, or like that's yeah. not going to happen. However, what you can do though is treat your tenants with respect. Yeah. Treat them like the customers that they are. Like they are providing a service. Like long-term rental real estate doesn't exist without a tenant, right? If there's right. never a tenant, yeah. you're not paying down the principal. You're not experiencing <laughs> the appreciation, the depreciation. All the things that investors love don't happen without tenants. So our strategy is let's treat the tenants like gold. Let's take care mm -hmm. of them. We have policies right like we don't get taken advantage of by tenants but we treat everybody well and we respond to them quickly and we fix things yeah. when they break and we answer the phone if they call that you know with that gift tenant retention thing is just part of an overarching strategy that we yeah. feel pays dividends hard to quantify but it's, it feel it, it, you it, can't we, you can't quantify we, we get <laughs> we get our the way well in some respects you can quantify it in the way like what's your average length of stay like, and you can benchmark that against like the industry average in your area this is very mm. dependent on the areas that you're in, right? Some, some areas are more transient than others, but we, our average tenant stays like between three and a half and four years. Yeah. I would argue that that's a, a decent length of stay that, you know, the number, oh, there are studies out there that say like the number one reason that tenants move outside of like major life changes, like divorce, death, those types of things. 
unattended to maintenance over. requests. Yeah. Yeah. I think so, that's the, the biggest thing that's helped us. You, you said something there, though, um, a, a trigger word I've been leaning on heavily is policy. Mm -hmm. And a tenant will ask for something or request something to be done. And I'm like, you know, that's that's not only against against our policy. They don't know. Most of them don't know that I'm part owner or the owner of the property. But when I say policy, it's like, hey, this is our policy on this. It There's really no argument that they can come back with, right? Do they think they're going to make our company change the policy? Mm -hmm. No, it's not going to happen. Yeah. So the other thing you mentioned in your, in your, when you were just describing the second thing, or maybe the first thing is a professional tenant and yeah. uh, the professional tenants, you know, are, are like a problem, right? Like, cause yeah. they know the laws, they know what to say, they know the things to claim. Um, and that is even more reason why you have to have policies and procedures in place, yep. why you have to have written documented policies and procedures, because the, I don't know exactly the states you're investing in, but we're, we're in California and the laws are definitely slanted towards the tenants. All right. <laughs> well, so, I'm in Alabama and Florida, so we're oh, you're good. You're the, good yeah, down there. Good. Yeah, you're good. <laughs> I think Arkansas is the only state right now that has on the books that that they they could put a tenant in jail for not paying the rent. Although they don't enforce oh, wow. the, they don't enforce that, that law. But I, I I was reading something a while back that Arkansas like there's some law that they'll jail a tenant. And I'm like, how would oh my how gosh. would you feel if you you had to put a tenant in jail for not paying rent? I don't. Oh, I couldn't do it. Yeah, that's, I don't that's, know. I don't. That's, that's, uh, I don't think it. Well, it, it, in. I don't think it happens. I think it's just some antiquated law that's like okay. still on their books. Uh, but it just goes to show you like the difference between a red and a, a blue state yeah. for sure. Yeah, definitely different. <laughs> Anyhow, so it sounds to me like you guys did the self-managing thing, said, uh, not for us, hired property management companies, potentially had some negative experiences. In fact, I'd be willing to bet a lot of money you had some negative experiences. We and had then, some negative experiences. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And then brought it back in house. But when you brought it back in house, you brought it back in house from a different point of view. The yeah. one of, okay, this is a business. We need to it's get our business. stuff together. We need to yeah. have policies, procedures, all the things. So that makes sense. That's like the natural progression. Like you're either going to yeah. hire the right management company or you're going to figure it out on your own. And you don't really have in, any in between. And um, in regards, Anyway, what's number three? What's number three? You said there was three. Yeah. So the number three thing is tenant screening proper tenant screening, you know, making sure you don't inherit. Well, if you inherit one, that's one thing, you know, you buy the property mm -hmm. where the tenants are already in place. But when you, you know, we used to not, when we first started out, it was, Hey, let's meet you at the property. You can look at it. I'll get a you know sense of who you are and we'll rent to you with no credit or background check. Right. Like, that was not that was not a good idea. <laughs> um, we lucked up our very first tenant that we did that with. It was incredible. She she stayed in that property for a year and a half. She was a college student. Uh, matter of fact, she worked at a um, she wasn't in college. I'm sorry. She worked for a technical school that trained you know HVACs, electrician, plumbing technicians. And when something would go wrong, she would tell me, "Hey, do you mind if?" the school they need a field trip they need to come over and get some field work in can they come over and look at this this is not working save me tons of money on labor because the labor was free i just had to pay for parts but she always paid on time and just really incredible we lucked up for it with her but after she she moved out um i don't know if she got married it doesn't matter she, she moved out and um um you know after then same process i was like well hey that worked before didn't work again, <laughs> you know, and, and we just learned that along the way to, to, uh, there's something to be said about a system in place where you, know, you have all these different filters in, right? So you, when you market the property, uh, you take applications before you show them, right? Uh, if it's that way, you know, if it's in a high demand where you're getting, you know, we, we had one unit become available. Um, we, we advertised for it within two days. We had a hundred applications. I'm like, wow, that's we, a, we're charging way too less for rent. So we took it off, let it set for a week, put it back on for another hundred bucks a month. And we were still getting, um, probably 10 or so applications a day. And so then we said, okay, well, if you're serious about this, you know, go ahead and do the background check, pay the 40 bucks to do the background and credit check. The serious ones did. 
before ever seeing the property. And we had, a, you know, I think we had a handful that did that and all but one were throwaways. I mean, they had some priors that we didn't want to yeah. mess with. And so uh, she was a good fit. She moved in right away, you know, and uh, she, she didn't, we approved her. She then went and looked at the property and then said, okay, yeah, I'll take it, you know? Yeah. So when you are taking applications, you're not charging for that. You charge some after what does we that don't look charge, like? Yeah, we don't charge applications. I know a lot of uh, landlords or property managers will, but it is through, so we use Hemlane, which is, um, I, it's a software solution that allows you to collect rent, um, do all, they, tenants can report maintenance issues. Um, you can message with your tenants. It's a document management system for all your leases and everything. Um, that is all included in what we use that for or, or the level that we're subscribed at. So it's more or less, they come in, it's applications, very brief information where gotcha. they fill out their, their history. They can put who their employer is. Um, they can upload pay stubs, copy the driver's license. So it doesn't cost us anything, just a little bit of our time, so to speak. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, again, goes back to, you got to treat it like a business, right? Like, the hard, like part, a business. Yep. the hard part is if you have one or two properties, it's not that difficult to go show the property to somebody. But if you, yeah. you know, but if you treat your business like it was a large business, like that's not scalable. You can't be running around all over town, hundreds of units showing people anytime they call. Yeah. You need a system and pro a system in place. And, you know, fair housing laws are real things and they, a lot of the times have to do with that initial interaction. Like who you pick to live in your property is like mm. one of, they say one of the most litigated parts of landlord tenant interactions. Because if, you, if you're if you accused of, you know, discriminating yeah. against somebody, which whether it happened or not doesn't doesn't really matter. matter. In fact, we, <laughs> yeah. we've had attorneys on who deal in fair housing lawsuits and basically they make an accusation against you. It's your job to prove to the fair housing department that you didn't. Guilty until <laughs> which proven is, innocent. Yeah, essentially, which is the craziest thing, which is why like getting a gut feeling from somebody is a terrible idea, right? Like yeah, yeah. you'll get, you, yeah. and obviously you, you learned your lessons on that one, but goes to the point though, that you got to have a system in place. I want to touch based on one thing um which you just sparked like a memory in my head when you said that your tenant had worked at the technical school and they had basically free labor i don't know if you know this or not i did not know this we had an insurance expert come on the show <laughs> yeah <laughs> there's such thing as like free labor or where this really comes into place is when you let a tenant repair something like mm. oh the tenant's a plumber he's gonna <clears throat> do some plumbing work or whatever yeah, which is always a bad idea. But if you get into a spot where you you had free labor, i.e., your tenant or you know student, whoever, yeah, whoever, yeah. the insurance companies don't cover free labor. Yeah. It has to be a professional, whatever license, whatever. And he, I didn't know that, and I was like, oh, so this is a bad idea on a whole bunch oh, of levels. Like, yeah. So, well, so and just to clear the airways there, I had to sign something uh, with the school that said it was okay for the students to work on the property. And in that document, they assured me that a licensed master, whatever, like oh, nice. plumber HVAC would be on site with them and, and essentially guiding them through. Oh, what perfect. Was being done. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and not, not to, not to throw shade at you, but just for the <laughs> listeners, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't yeah. No, let your tenants point. do work on your property because if they do some janky thing and it floods your house, your it's insurance company, gonna, you. they're going to hang you out to dry because if they can deny a claim, they absolutely will. But, uh, yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Good, good advice. So, um, yeah, good advice on the three things. Uh, I want to get into the five things cause that, that is closer <laughs> to home. So okay. I, when I was doing just for our sake of our listeners, when I was doing my research on Jay, he, on his LinkedIn page, was it a presentation or what was it that you were doing? We, Webinar I did a, maybe? Or? Yeah, I did a presentation on it. Um, and there might be just some, uh, random posts that kind of summarize it all, but yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, we, why don't you tell our listeners what the title was so I don't butcher it? Yeah, so it's uh, five signs that your property manager is stealing from you. So not awesome. that Peter's doing yeah. this, but here's a checkup if you use him as your yeah. property manager. A absolutely. <laughs> so to give context to our listeners, and our listeners know because I rally about this quite a bit, um, there's a lot of the, 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 the reputation that property management companies have is well-deserved because yeah. most of them are really bad. 
And if you're an investor or an accidental landlord and you've worked with a property management company before, you more than likely have had a really bad experience. And I think there's a lot of reasons for that, which we don't have to get into, but um, <laughs> it, uh, well, let's just touch on those. So it's, it's probably okay. r- relevant to the conversation. The number one thing I think that breeds apathy in the property management company is their clients don't mean that much to them. And the reason I say, and this is, by the way, this is not my opinion. I don't agree with this, but this is my assessment. This of is not what your company, uh, yes. this is not a <laughs> motto hanging on the wall of your company's office, yeah. right? <laughs> so there, there's not a lot of businesses that controls the finances of their clients, right? For example, you hire a plumbing company to come fix your leaky faucet. They come do it. If they don't fix the faucet, you're not paying them. You're gonna go, mm-hmm. you didn't fix the faucet, fix the faucet and then I'll pay you. Yeah. That's not how property management works. Like you hire the property management company, they control your money, i.e. the rent. They, yep. ca- they pay themselves first. They pay the vendors first for maintenance, whatever things that happen, and they give you what's left over. And if you're not happy with them, it, you don't have the option to not pay them. Your only option as a client is to fire them. Well, hiring a property management company and vetting a property management company is like akin to putting needles in your eyes. Like nobody likes doing it. <laughs> it's difficult to do. It's hard to, to do effectively. So there's a problem there. So, and then the other thing is management companies have hundreds and hundreds of clients. So if they have one client who's mad at them, who's gonna fire them, not that big of a deal. They there's, don't care. They don't care because they have all the other cash flow coming in from all the other clients. This is one of the reasons why they're so bad. In my opinion, they're lazy because the, the, <laughs> they, they control the money. They get paid yeah. first and they don't have to make you happy to get paid. They have to make you happy to keep you there, but it's such a sticky relationship and it's such a pain in the butt to go find a new one. That they know, they they're, know not, they're pretty sticky. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, that's why, that's why people, in my opinion, that's the number one structural problem with the way our property management industry is structured, but it is what it is. It's how, it, how it's structured, but anyhow. Yeah. So yeah, let's get into the five. And I'm not afraid of these five, by the way, because <laughs> I'm I'm we I'm pretty confident in the job that we do. But but let's hear them, because and, and by the, for the for the the other the one thing that I'll shut up is I don't know what these five things. I was going to say I was going to I was going to give you I was going to give you some props. You didn't ask me what the five were for before what the five were before we started talking about it. So uh, number five is you're spending way more on maintenance items than one should, right? And if you're a new property uh, landlord, uh, how are you gonna know that? It's pretty simple. There are really a handful of things that are that are pretty common uh, maintenance wise, right? There's clock toilets, there's capacitor replacements on HVAC systems. Um, I got a list here. Why don't I just cheat on that instead of trying to re- <laughs> replace my memory? Um, toilets, you know, there's only a couple of inner workings on in the toilet. You got a faulty flush valve or a fill valve, you got a wax seal replacement or a toilet replacement itself. You can call a plumber, call a handful of plumbers and just say, hey, what do you charge for? insert one of those things, right? Or you call an HVAC technician, hey, uh, technician, what do you charge for a capacitor replacement, right? What do you charge for an exterior unit replacement? What do you charge for an interior unit replacement? Now, they're gonna ask you some questions you may not know the answer to, but that'll be part of the education process, right? And you're gonna start seeing, and you can do this proactive or you can do this reactive, you know, wait till something happens and you look at your monthly report from your property manager, but. I just got charged $700 for a wax seal uh, to be installed on my toilet. That's high. I don't care where you live in the country, but that's mm-hmm. that's way high, right? So the number five is you're paying way more on maintenance items than you should. And you hit on a couple of those things, Peter, where, you know, as self-managers, you're going to verify that that happened, right? You're not just going to be like, oh, we got the invoice. Let's go ahead and pay the invoice, uh, which most property managers do. Um, Number four is. Well, hold, 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 yeah. hold, hold yeah, on. I want, I want to, I want to, I want to rebut every one of these. Okay. No, okay, not, okay. not rebut. One, I totally agree with you. I totally agree with you. And what we do in our, and this is not me trying to justify Rincon, but just to give our listeners a perspective. And it, honestly, it might, it, you know, a lot of our clients listen, they might go, oh, that's why you guys do that. This has to do with setting the expectation. Our clients are typically are accidental landlords, so they're right. not that person that's sitting behind 10 spreadsheets, benchmarking (laughs) maintenance costs against, you know, the last 10 years, and they know what that property should be doing from a maintenance perspective. We want them to be like that, but it's not, you can't make people do that, right? 
But what we do do is we benchmark our own portfolio and we know what percentage of income across our portfolio is being spent on maintenance, is being spent on, not spent, but being accounted for in vacancy loss, being spent on capital improvements, right? So we know those numbers. So when we bring on a new client, part, one of the conversations we have is, you need a budget for this rental property, no different than the thousand unit apartment complex that has yeah. budgets on budgets on budgets, right? You And we, it's very basic, very generic, like we tell them, you should expect to spend between five and 10%, and it obviously depends on the property. If it's a brand new house, it's different than a 1900 right. house. You should you should expect to spend five to ten percent of the rental the gross rental income on maintenance. If you're not spending that, it's a red flag because yeah. the things are breaking. I promise, <laughs> your tenants just aren't telling you. Or if you and then if the flip side, if you're spending thirty percent of the rental income, that also is a rental fl a red flag that yeah. needs to be investigated. There may be a reason, but it needs Could to be, be. investigated. Could be so. Got to trust but verify, right? <laughs> yeah. So that's what we. That's the conversation we have up front. Then the conversation we have at the end of the cycle of a, our when our lease renewal happens, we do our inspection, we share it with our client, and then we do a rudimentary financial analysis. So we say, yeah. Mr. Owner, you collected thirty thousand dollars in gross rent. You spent whatever two twenty five hundred dollars on repairs. There was no vacancy. You should plan for these capital improvements. Your HVAC system is on the fritz. This is going to need to be replaced in the next year. So that's yeah. how we handle that, which builds trust with our clients. But so, if you don't do those things, I can see where you'd, you'd have those issues. I think I think you need. I think you can rebuttal <laughs> my presentation with the top five <laughs> things uh, to know when you have a, a solid property manager, right? Because you just yeah. you mentioned two there. Uh, and by the way, all these five things came from. Uh, me living through it, right? You, mm -hmm. I said earlier, we started self-managing, turning things over. And then about a year and a half ago, we discovered, uh, almost two years now, we discovered they, they were stealing from us. So yeah. this is- I want to get to that one. I want to get to that one. Yeah. I want to hear yeah. that story. But anyway, <laughs> well, let, let, it kind of plays out in these, in the, in these top five points. So this okay. is, you know, there was, um, uh, this one took a little digging, but basically the maintenance uh, company, that was showing up on our P&L that was doing all the maintenance work did not exist. That was one of them. <laughs> so, uh, so number four is your property manager has trained your tenants to only pay with money orders. Okay. Do tell, do tell. <laughs> so we started sniffing around and noticing things weren't, uh, adding up. And I said, okay, well, let me, I, you know, we, we have a tenant living in our property for a year has not paid rent. And I call and I talked to the property manager and I said, Hey, or, uh, I, I want the tenant's phone number. I want to call and find out what's going on. Cause obviously you're not doing your job is what I wanted to say. But I called him up and he goes, uh, no, I've, I've been paying. I've been told to pay with money orders and mail it in. I've got the receipts, blah, blah, blah. I was like, okay, interesting. Took that information back to the property manager. They denied it, denied it, denied it. Things kept adding up. Um, and we eventually fired them, right? And so I had this log. It was 17000 in accounts receivable uh, from a handful of tenants. And I called every tenant and I said, hey, um, you know, we, we took over property management for this company. I see you have an account balance, uh, a, a open balance of late rent. Nope been paying every month i was told to pay with money orders told to mail them in um i've got some of the receipts don't have all of them you know various things everybody who is late was advised to pay with money orders and and our, yeah. my first my first uh kind of figuring this out i told our property manager we no longer accept money orders you can take check you can take cash if you want to write a receipt you have to write a receipt we no longer accept money orders, right? I don't think I said we take cash. Uh, I think it was like, hey, we only take checks. And he, was, he argued with me, he said, nope, it's a legal tender, we have to accept it. I was like, I'm saying our policy is not to accept it. And they wouldn't, they wouldn't move from it. 
So. Yeah, so I don't know if there's any excuse for that one. That, that that's that's like uh, theft. Like I think yeah, oh yeah, it's a crime. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't I don't know that that one needs to be defended. It sounds like you got a really bad property management company. Yeah, on that one. But what did you do? Like after you figured out they were stealing from you, what did you do other than fire them? Did you? So we we sought legal counsel uh, on this property. We have uh, a handful of partners and. Uh, mm -hmm. All in all, it was going to cost us about thirty grand to go after them, and our partners decided that, that was going to be good money chasing bad, because uh, mm -hmm. it's one of those things in the state of Alabama. It, you know, it's it's one. Of, how do I put it? Um, it it's not a uh, we we only pay if they win for us kind of thing. Like we're we're putting the money up front to go after it. And in some cases, it was real. Hard. In most of the cases, it was real hard because it was basically not all tenants kept receipts for their money orders. Mm. Um, and so when it added up, we didn't, there was not enough there, you know, to pursue uh, gotcha. for potential getting it. So it became tenant's word versus landlord's word. And, you know, at that point in time, it becomes hearsay. So it's basically what can you prove in the court? And we're like, yeah, we can't really prove it. Yeah, you know, and so I don't, I don't, yeah, mm -hmm. I don't know how to prevent that one other than you need to do your homework up front. Not you, well, but for our listeners. No, sake. no, no. It's it, it was all on me because I was I was the managing member for this, and after this all happened, like I'm sitting there with egg on my face in front of my partners because I recommended the property manager because I'd used him with another mm -hmm. property for years, you know, and, and I said, look, guys, this is all on me. I got way too comfortable um, with our communication again. Treat it as a business, right? Like I got way too comfortable with our property manager and um, I let some things slide and didn't check up on him as much as I should have. And, and here's where we are, right? And this is all on me and I'm gonna make it right. And um, we eventually did. Um, it took us a little okay. bit of time, but we did, yeah. Yeah, that's um, an extreme case, but yeah, definitely. Yeah. That was a hard lesson. <laughs> <laughs> definitely a hard one, hard one. Yeah. And then, so that transitions to, uh, you know, if tenants aren't paying rent or there's no documentation that tenants were paying rent two things should happen uh past due notices there should be some documentation of past due notices that have been posted to the front of the door so we got to do it in the state of alabama right or mm -hmm. evictions should have been started for people who you know were at least six months behind i mean we i do it now uh the month that they're behind i start i start the eviction process uh, actually it's seven days uh, after we post the notice but that was the one argument I had with our property managers. Like, well, if you're not collecting rent or you're saying one of two things are happening because we found out, and this kind of goes into number, number two, um, or actually it goes into number one. I'll save that comment for that. But the, okay. basically there was, there was no documentation of, um, collected rent and send if there's no collected rent, then they should be posting past due notices. Yeah. They, they or need to be evictions. enforcing their, yeah, and they need you to force your rent collection. <laughs> yeah, in the state of Alabama, you have to document that stuff, so you have to be able to take it to the court with you if you go to court. There was no documentation whatsoever, right? So there's a yeah. chance they were just stealing from us and not and hoping we didn't catch on. It sounds – obviously, this is the same property management company that was stealing yes. from you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah all, all of these five tips come from the same experience from one? with the same guy. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, uh, that's a bummer. Yeah. I mean, so the best practice here is you enforce your rent collection. One, you have a rent collection policy. Two, you enforce it and you don't make exceptions to it because you don't want to be accused of discriminating against. You, you yeah. didn't collect against this class of people. You collected only against this class of people, right? So yeah. the best practice is rents due on whatever day. Most places are on the first. first. Some people have a grace period. At the day after that grace period, you need to be po in California. We have a three day pair quit, but you're posting it, documenting that you've done it. And then that starts a three day here. Anyway, it's different in every state starts a clock at the end of that clock. Ours is three days. You're filing the eviction uh, yeah. because people don't generally change their behavior. Once they start paying rent late, rent late they're going to keep paying their rent late. And if oh, yeah. they're not paying, you don't want to get in a situation where we're three months in you, they owe you ten thousand dollars and then you start the eviction like yeah yeah That's the other it. thing i'll say the other thing i'll say is i don't know a good property management software would have alleviated some of this stuff too because you would have had the names the dates they paid all the things yeah. versus if they weren't paying 
you also would have been notified about it, and you could have done something about it then. Yeah. But yeah, I, th I think okay. you, I think uh, number one is going to blow your mind. But we'll do number okay. two next. All right. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, is is the number two uh, point? It might be a sign that your property manager is stealing from you. Is you consistently have to beg, borrow, and plea to get end of month reports, and even when you get them, <laughs> they're three months late. Yeah. That's a that's a huge red flag. <laughs> this company are this company still in business or no? They are. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't think there's a, this one doesn't even need an I don't explanation. Like, I don't think for long, but yeah, yeah, they, they are. You have to. I mean, one, this should be automated, right? Like nobody should yeah. be sending out these reports. Like we're in the, it's 2023, right? Like, Correct. Yeah. Th th this. <laughs> yeah. I don't know who those people were, but th that's bad. Um, yeah, and I don't want to say this only happens in Alabama because one of our <laughs> one of our competitors in town here, the Department of Real Estate literally shackled up the front door oh, and wow. said this company is out of business. They Good were missing like they were missing like six hundred thousand dollars in their clients' money. It's all public record. Like once they make yeah. once the Department of Real Estate like rules on and I we read it and it was like oh my gosh wow. like there's this goes back to there's so many bad property management companies out there. I'll say one yeah. other thing about why I think a lot of them are bad. Most property management companies come from sales, real estate sales positions. Mm. So you're a, you're a successful realtor, you're selling, helping people sell and buy real estate. Your clients for sure are gonna come to you and go, hey, I don't know any property management companies, can you just manage this manage property it. for yeah. me? <laughs> That's and point. the agent will say yes, because they <laughs> want to protect that relationship for yeah. future business. Before you know it, the agent has a small portfolio which is a dumpster fire, like just a train wreck, because there's no policies, there's no procedures, there's no tech, there's no nothing. Then they go, okay, well, I have a mess on my hands here. I'm gonna have to try to figure this out. By then it's too late, and the, all the balls are rolling towards just a terrible yeah. management company. But that's the other yeah. big reason why I think that's it is, because they don't treat it like a business, because managing property is not the same as buying and selling property. They're two no. totally different disciplines that need different skill sets and different, areas of expertise anyway all right we're we number two or we're number one that was number two so number one okay. is the uh the amount of rent collected that's shown on the reports whenever you finally get them the amount of rent collected on those reports does not match what's arriving in your bank account that's yeah. that's doesn't take a whole lot to figure that out right and it didn't take us to figure that out uh, long to figure that out it's like um total revenue does not match deposits month one month two help me understand <laughs> yeah yeah it's hard to believe a company like that's still in business i well <clears throat> i i don't know you know it's it, it it is it is um we you know when they, we first discovered this it got very emotional it's like man how do we put them out of business how do we make sure everybody in this city knows who they are and what they represent and what i what i come to surmise is is basically um uh, I could waste a lot of energy for that and, and just kind of understood, go about it. You know, I'll leave a Google review, tell my side of the story. Uh, if I run across somebody who's using them, I'll share that story with them. Yeah. And, um, I don't, I don't imagine, um, cause the, the city this is in, it, it's a well connected city. Like it's not a major city, but it's one of those, you know, it's Alabama. It's good old boy theater. Everybody knows everybody. So the more the word gets out, they're not going to be around for long. I think where they, where they have been successful or, or continue to be in business is most of their clients are out of state investors. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, um, uh, you're not you're not in Huntsville, Alabama, are you? No, uh, okay. It's in Mobile, Mobile, Alabama. Okay, gotcha. It's down by the gotcha. coast. Yeah. Um, you must know somebody in Huntsville. Oh, so I network with um, people like me who own management companies. We belong to yeah. an industry association all over the country, and yeah, but, I mean yeah. Alabama, like the, it, I mean Huntsville was like the the baby of real estate investors for a while, right? They were yeah. flocking there. Like everybody <laughs> wanted to go to Huntsville with the aero, you know, the the, it, the aerospace air industry engineering and yeah. all that. Yeah, but uh, I know some. I don't even want to know who it is because I, I know some people in Alabama, and hopefully it's not that. <laughs> I, although the industry association we belong to is like literally the the practices in that 
association are way above the regular property management companies. Like it yeah. only represents like the five percent of the management companies in the country um, who are trying to elevate and do things the right way and, and it put best practices forward and whatnot. But um, we produce a fair amount of content, so we actually have. I should send it to you because you would get a kick out of it, especially with this presentation you just did. <laughs> um, what to do if your management company stops taking your calls? How, how to know how to know it's time to fire your management company? I think was a video yeah. we did, and then we put a ton of content into how to properly vet a management company yeah. because you're at a disadvantage as a consumer when you want to go investigate a property management company. You just are. They're not going to open their books to you. They're not going to tell you all their dirty little secrets. But there nope. are things you can do to figure some of that stuff out. And we go over that a lot too, because we want people making good decisions. And there's a lot of bad potential management companies in our area that you could end up with if you don't do your homework. And they're, they're everywhere. Of- doesn't matter, you know, California, Alabama, Florida, it doesn't matter. There's just, it's hard. And that's why, you know, when we found this out and we've, we we're getting ready to fire them, um, you know, we started interviewing other property management companies. And um, I didn't know about you guys at the time. And, and but I just I, I couldn't get over, you know, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice. Uh, I'm just gonna take it back in house, and I'm just I'm just gonna be mm-hmm. you know treat it like a business. And um, you know we've we've um, I, that prop those properties have um, never performed better yep. in the last year and a half. And we've had one of them for about five years, and the other one for. Um, two and a half and you know it's just it's it's incredible it, it, and this is, is so important to have the right property management in place because that's that's kind of the heartbeat of your property I mean if you don't have the right people in place to handle day to day operations things can go south very quickly you know and you mentioned earlier something about um, the number one reason why tenants leave is because landlords don't respond to maintenance requests Right. We had in this property where this this land, uh, property manager we found out was stealing from us. Um, there was a maintenance request from tenant. I started calling tenants and saying, hey, why are you behind in rent? You know, essentially, I, I was a little softer than that. But I, I would say, hey, why are you yeah. behind in rent? And he's like, do you know that I reported this water leak uh, four months ago and nobody's even been out here to check on it? I was like, no, <laughs> tell me more. And the guy had a water leak in his apartment. Uh, and this was to the point where it was uh, getting to, to be where it was unhealthy for him to be in there, you know. And um, uh, so when we took over, we moved him out. We had a, a, a unit come vacant like the same month that we took, a, took over, moved him out, moved him into the, the new unit that didn't have the water leak got the water leak fixed and it was like 14 grand worth of damage for us to to get this thing repaired and back livable again you know and i'm like and i have the cell g- phone g- records of where yeah. he had called and tried to contact the property manager and they never went on site so this is a great point because you can take a great real estate investment deal like you yeah. got a smoking deal under market Yep. Plenty of room to add value, all these things. You put the wrong property management company in place, they will tank that deal. It will never Easily. perform. The, the, what you're saying is a perfect example. The guy didn't collect the rent. He, he, he took probably a couple hundred dollar leak repair and turned it into a $14,000 oh, yeah. problem. Plus you had to move the guy out. Plus you lost rent from that. I just hope people hear this and understand how critical it is to put the right property management company in place. And it's not just about the only the number one thing that you go to when you're evaluating a managed company is price because it's the easiest thing to compare. What yeah. are you going to charge me? And I am here to tell you if I charged you 1% management fee, but I did what your property management company did to you, totally not worth I'd it. be ripping you off. <laughs> you would be getting a bad deal. Mm. Yeah, that that yeah, actually yeah, yeah. I follow it, you it, yeah. <laughs> it pisses me off when I hear these stories because these companies are it's criminal. Like it's criminal. They're supposed to be there protecting your investment. They're yep. making it worse and costing you tens of thousands of dollars in the process. Oh, well, I feel like we both got on our soapbox on that one. But, um, <laughs> well, I I hope somebody you know listen to this. I hope they learn something to to take away from it. Um, and you know don't. The fear of the unknown is, is one thing. And I think, you know, you, you said earlier, you can't go into it blind, but sometimes I feel like the, you know, if, 
we would have taken that 16 unit and just I said, all right, we want to, we're going to take it on ourselves, even though it's in, you know, it's remote. All this is remote, by the way, we don't live near our properties. And I was like, if we can, if we can just take it on and figure it out along the way, you know, looking back now, we would be in a much better spot than we are, you know, actually going through all that. So I, I think there is something about on the job training or on the job learning that you kind of have to go through or you can go through and you'll be okay versus hire, you know, using your 1% example and coming out, um, being stolen yeah. from. So, yeah. Well, Jay, this was an, uh, an intriguing <laughs> conversation. I, I, I really enjoyed the whole top five things your management company is ripping you off about. Screwed us with, yeah. That was, that was good. That was good. Um, if our listeners are interested in following you, reaching out, what's, what's the best way for them to do that? So I'm extremely active on LinkedIn. Uh, so you can check me just Jay Helms on, on LinkedIn, or if you want to find out what all is going on with W2 Capitalist, W2Capitalist.com. And one thing I'd like to offer ever, you said most of the listeners on this are, are newer investors or accidental mm -hmm. landlords. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if you guys are in a situation where you've gotten the bug and you want to expand and you now want to uh, actively start growing, uh, I wrote a book, it's called Make an Offer. And I'll give everybody who wants a free copy, I'll give you a free copy, either hard copy. I thought I had one around. That's why I'm looking around. I don't have a copy out here, but I'll, I'll just give you a copy. So just uh, reach out and uh, I'll get one to you. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you very much. I appreciate you coming on the show. Thanks, Peter.